Good morning. Buenos dias. Uh, welcome to the Inter-American Dialogue, and thank you all for, for joining us this morning. Uh, we're very pleased uh, to be doing this event uh, together in collaboration with Reporters Without Borders, our good friends, and, um, and uh, we are look forward to continued uh, partnership with them on issues that concern uh, both organizations. Uh, our, the dialogue's plan was to hold our final event of the year last week, um, but uh, it seems that Daniel Ortega, who is not uh, indifferent to the holiday spirit, uh, decided to upset our plan. And a week ago today, Nicaraguan police raided offices of media organizations and five civil society groups, seizing sensitive information and threatening their lives. The attacks immediately drew international condemnation from, in, from human rights commissions of the United Nations and the Organization of American States, as well as many independent civil society groups. Among those attacked was Carlos Fernando Chamorro, one of the country's most prominent and fearless independent journalists, who directs and edits the weekly Confidencial and host the television show Esta Semana. Carlos Fernando is a very close personal friend and also a friend of the dialogue who has spoken many times uh, at our events. His mother and former president, Doña Violeta Chamorro, is a longtime member of the Inter-American Dialogue, and Carlos Fernando's daughter uh, interned here uh, just a few years ago. In the midst of such a crackdown, uh, Manuel Orozco, without hesitation, said we had to organize a meeting to better understand the significance of these attacks, discuss what we should expect next, and of course discuss steps that can and should be taken to respond to and address a very grave situation that erupted with street protests and government repression uh, on April 18th that has already resulted in over well over 300 uh, lives in Nicaragua. I wanna thank Manuel for his leadership on the dialogue's work on Nicaragua, in addition to his responsibilities directing the Migration, Remittances, and Development Program, he's organized a number of meetings. He supported the OAS Working Group on Nicaragua, <clears throat> has testified before Congress, and has written many articles, including in the New York Times. Manuel has graciously agreed to moderate this session, and fortunately, we have four superb speakers who bring different perspectives to the topic. Uh, I'm pleased to introduce uh, Margo Ewan, who is the Executive Director of Reporters Without Borders, North America, um, who is the co-sponsor, who has uh, co-sponsored this event with the dialogue. Anival Toruño, the manager and owner of Ra Radio Dario, and Felix Maradigaga, Executive Director of the Institute of Strategic Studies and Public Policy in Nicaragua, and Tanya Morzik Amador, the Executive Director of Corner of Love. So we have great speakers. The topic is urgent and uh, look forward to a productive uh, meeting this morning. And thanks again to all of you for coming and on the part of, on behalf of the dialogue, uh, happy holidays to everybody. With that, let me turn it over to Manuel. Manuel? You can hear me. Okay. Well, um, thank you uh, for coming in just short notice, we'll, we should say, because we sent the invitation last Monday and we have a very good um, participation. Um, as Michael said, this is uh, an important event because it has to do with issues that are affecting uh, a number of problems that are taking place in Latin America, but particularly are affecting the conditions, the social and political conditions of Nicaraguans with regards to human rights, freedom of expression, freedom of association, freedom of worship, among other problems that are taking place in the country. This is the practically the eighth month that protests started in Nicaragua after um, an attempt to pass a law 
uh, imposing uh, restrictions on, pay on the pension system in Nicaragua erupted into um, what it became state-sponsored repression. Um, there's been more than 500 uh, people detained, more than 500 deaths, but more importantly is that um, the protest and the resistance has been a nonviolent action that has come across um, very clearly among the leadership and the Nicaraguan citizenship. The, the purpose of these demonstrations has focused predominantly on political reforms in the country. And the response has been basically a rejection for dialogue or negotiation to these political reforms. Um, surprisingly, to some extent, Nicaragua has entered into what I call repression 2.0. There is a condition by which since the criminalization of protests in July, the, the state decided to basically start the legitimating and the de delegalizing uh, civil society organizations of different sorts. But it's also persecuting individuals, detaining um, clandestinely a number of people in rural areas, and uh, confiscating property, seizing property at this point, uh, even though legally the, the Constitution doesn't allow the government to do so. Um, the situation is one that it seems to uh, show that the, there is a greater distance today than in April to establish some sort of engagement with the Nicaraguan government. And so the, in, under these circumstances, the conditions are really more dramatic, more problematic and in addition to that, there is a growing deterioration of the economy in the country. Uh, economic growth uh, this year is going to be a negative 4.0, and most likely next year is going to continue declining. There is a decline of 40% tourism, um, negative 40%, um, which is one of the important sources of uh, economic growth in Nicaragua. Even family remittances did not grow this year as they grew the year before, partly because there are more than 50,000 Nicaraguans in Costa Rica today um, seeking refuge from the repression. So along those lines, um, we decided to talk to, to some of the participants who have been basically to some extent affected by the conditions in the country, uh, the expulsions uh, from Nicaragua uh, of di for different reasons, but mostly associated to the call for political change in the country. So Margot even and the dialogue, we, uh, Reporters Without Borders and the dialogue, decided to talk a little bit about uh, these issues. So with that, there are three basic questions that I have to the group that um, are as a basis to talk on these issues. The, the first one is it, um, mostly what is the significance or what impact does this efforts to delegitimate, to delegalize uh, freedom of expression, freedom of association, freedom of religion uh, have into uh, Nicaraguan society. And second, um, what can be done to really mitigate these levels of repression? Is there a chance for fewer than um, changes in the country from the international community? Today, the NICA Act was formally signed uh, in the executive, executive office. Um, as a means to put pressure on the Nicaraguan government to, Im to start engaging um, civil society and the Nicaraguan resistance. Um, and third, uh, are there any other tools that can be utilized to nudge the Nicaraguan government to really engage in a dialogue? Um, the demands are not about um, anything dramatic, but basically to talk and establish a set of negotiations over important political reforms. Um, the reality is that the extent of democratic practice in Nicaragua has been dramatically affected by the fact that political authority is monopolized by a single entity. Both Congress, the Supreme Court, the uh, Elections Commission, and autonomous entities are completely controlled. Over 80% of the voting authority is in the hands of one single person. So the quality of democracy is in de facto and the jury compromised. Therefore, this is not an issue about a capricious desire to establish a removal of a president, but it's actually a genuine request for political change to have a much more democratic uh, participation in the country. So along those lines, I open the floor for uh, your participation. Margot, welcome. 
Thank you so much for uh, having me, and I'm very proud to partner uh, on behalf of Reporters Without Borders with the dialogue for this event today. Um, just to kind of paint the picture from a press freedom perspective, media freedom perspective, um, my organization, uh, Reporteros Sin Fronteras in Spanish, uh, is an international nonprofit defending journalists, protecting journalists around the world. And we rank uh, 180 countries based on their level of press freedom. Um, Nicaragua is at 90 uh, place, 90th place out of 180 countries currently. And unfortunately, what's happened uh, at Confidencial is the latest in a series of attacks that we've seen escalate. It's in the top 10. 90, 90. 90. Yes. <laughs> um, so we've seen uh, escalations uh, progressively since April when we first noticed uh, increased repression of media outlets um, and uh, violence against protesters, unfortunately, has led to uh, at least one death of a journalist, Angel Gaona, uh, earlier this year. And we're seeing paramilitary forces and snipers while they are uh, targeting journalists, there are local, me uh, targeting protesters, there are local media covering protests who are putting themselves at risk in order to cover this, particularly local and community media, um, particularly thinking about what happened with uh, uh, Radio Dario burned to the ground uh, in the state of Leon and uh, other independent local media having this similar attacks against them regularly. But then you also have independent and opposition radio uh, experiencing this as well. Uh, political opponents who have been jailed, um, targeted rep uh, repression against opposition leaders, including students, unions, etc. Though there haven't been any continued detention of reporters, they have been briefly arrested. Uh, they have been uh, the victim of threats by police officers, accusations that they're trying to overthrow the government. Uh, and so we're concerned that that may escalate further to actual prolonged detention of journalists uh, in the country. Um, and we're seeing journalists being followed in the streets, uh, surveilled with drones, uh, having their homes surveilled, uh, editors at times, uh, as I mentioned, arrested and threatened with death from police officers, which is incredibly frightening. Uh, and you know, we're seeing in the global context of press freedom, we just published our annual report on violence uh, and abuses against the press uh, earlier this week on Tuesday. We have a total of 80 uh, professional journalists, citizen journalists, and media workers killed worldwide so far in 2018. And we're seeing this hatred of journalists being proclaimed by political leaders, businessmen, religious leaders that is translating to violence on the ground. And so when we look at what's happening in Nicaragua, and we are seeing the signs of violent repression starting to build to a crescendo. We are very concerned uh, to the point where we are trying to raise the issues happening in Nicaragua to the more global stage and trying to raise this uh, from an advocacy perspective to uh, highest levels of international community, including the United Nations Secretary General. Um, good morning. It is a pleasure to be here. And I want to thank the International Dialogue for giving us this window of talking to the world and being a companion of special persons that uh, also are fighting from his uh, perspective in the problem that we have, in the crisis that we have in Nicaragua. I want to excuse myself because my English is not as good and I've been working a while to have some writing notes. Ortega can attack the media and journalists, but what he's not going to achieve is this, the decision of us, of us to continue informing. The, the ideas cannot be silent, nor destroyed, or confiscated. The message is not killed by killing the messenger. And that's what Ortega is being done to our country, to our press, for women and men, the fighting with the opportunity to give us a good picture of what's going on in Nicaragua. In a displace of arrogance and military force, 
he tried to silence us. We are on the attack, chasing us, fabricating accusations of false crimes against journalists and human rights defenders, including Bishop. The world must stop him. The level of chasing has fading scale. He accuses us from crimes that himself has committed and reuse it. The cleanup operation that left the country with more than 500 dead. Ortiga regime is treating us as criminal and enemies of the dictatorship. We hold Daniel Ortega responsible in his capacity as a supreme head of the police force and a head of the army for an additional attack that may occur against journalists, men and women from press, to the staff of the Radio Darío, Doña Vilma Núñez Escorcia, Miguel Mora, and before the accusation of Murillo to indicate, indicating the traidores y vende patria a Carlos Fernando Chamorro and his family. And from this photo, we asking the life and the integrity of them be respected. The memory of the assassination of his father cannot be repeated. I call an SOS to the world and to the democratic governments, an international organization to stop Daniel Ortega. If we make a relation of the size of the population and the time of the violence as the human tragedy of our nation, only compare with Saddam Hussein, Idi Amin, the Uganda, Bashar al-Assad, or Pol Pot. What is happening in, in our country is nothing else the crimes against humanity. Ortega, Ortega and his partner found a hole in the democratic system. Condemnation, protest, and other measurements such as invocation of the democratic charter from my view I have to conclude, the sanctions without concrete actions are not enough to stop the massive violation of the human right and freedom of expression in my country. It is important to the world to send this SOS to stop Daniel Ortega, life of journalists, women and men are in danger. There is a good example with Carlos Fernando, a great family, and here is the fighting for freedom of the express from his father. And now he's confronting the same situation with the risk of being killed by a, by a dictatorship, Daniel Ortega. Uh, thank you for the invitation. I, I want to also thank the dialogue for uh, um, creating the space and also acknowledging the, the leadership of uh, Dr. Manuel Orozco also for, for this uh, activity. I would like to briefly give you uh, an overview of why civil society organizations in Nicaragua are so important. Um, in, in 1990, when we started the democratic experiment that had a brief um, time from 1990 until January 2007 when Daniel Ortega came into power again due to some corrupt strategies that, are, that, are, that go well beyond the scope of this conversation. During that 16-year experiment with democracy, the international community recognized that without robust democratic institutions, uh, falling back into tyranny was just a matter of time. And that's why the international community invested massive resources in building civil society organizations from the grassroots. If you look, for example, at the component of international cooperation, a substantial part of such cooperation was uh, directed towards building uh, uh, freedom of the press, for example, in supporting even faith-based organizations, in supporting uh, youth organizations. And after that period of time, Daniel Ortega in 2007 uh, um, uh, found a country that had one of the most vibrant 
civil society organizations in Latin America. Over 4,000 NGOs that had been built in that 16 year period of time from NGOs that worked as watchdog organization, uh, think tanks, some of them such as FUNIDES and YEP that ranked top 10 in Latin America, in the case of FUNIDES top, uh, top of 10 as well in the area of economic research. Uh, YEP, my organization, uh, top 50 in the world according to the, the University of Pennsylvania think tank index in the field of social inclusion and transparency. Uh, it's very important to understand that because without understanding the role of civil society organizations in democracy building, it's really hard to understand why Daniel Ortega has focused on these particular organizations. He knew that he had already controlled the party system. And many NGOs in Nicaragua had to adopt a role that is not traditional for NGOs. It's the role of political parties. But what happens in a society where political parties are completely absorbed by an hegemonic, hegemonic party, in this case the Sandinista party, which changed the constitution, changed the law, and practically destroyed all opposition parties, and those parties that didn't want to play by the rules imposed by Ortega were declared illegal. The last act happened in June 2016 when a democratic coalition emerged and was about to run in the elections and it was also declared illegal. So those who think that Daniel Ortega is the result of an electoral system are, were simply not paying attention. For, for the last 11 years, all political parties were destroyed. So many NGOs such as YEP, for example, eventually became more political in, in, in its narrative because it, uh, as a watchdog organization, as an organization that trains youth leaders so they can understand, for example, the public budget, uh, as an organization that trains women organization, minorities, indigenous communities, so they can participate with a more sophisticated dialogue in, in, in town hall meetings, for example. Daniel Ortega was also looking or perceiving that people were, were uh, going to town hall meetings asking for tough questions. These tough questions were not being, being asked by political parties. They're being asked by NGO leaders. And also there was something fascinating happening within the civil society ecosystem. Uh, there's a set of organizations that uh, I will call them the venerable organizations. Organizations such as CINCO with Carlos Fernando Chamorro. Organizations as, such as Movimiento por Nicaragua, such as Hagamos Democracia, such as FUNIDES, such as YEP. They were turning into sort of men mentors of emerging organizations, youth, women, indigenous organizations, a fascinating collaboration that called the attention even of academics because that was hap what was happening was fascinating. So in April 18th, we saw uh, um, a, a massive number of young people, students, campesino movements, um, members of the private sector going to the streets to, to, to ask not only for economic reforms, but also for democratic reforms. Ortega did not know what happened. He was in shock because he believed he controlled everything. It was a sort, of, a sort of train that hit him and he didn't know where the train came from. But after a few weeks, he analyzed where all this thing came and he had to invent a narrative, which is the narrative of El Golpe Suave, the coup d'etat. But something was uh, 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 true and is that the uh, uh, civil society had awakened. Uh, uh, and and uh, um, the press was really playing it's a fundamental role in, in energizing the population in its, in its search uh, for freedom. Um, what just happened a few uh, weeks ago is something that organizations such as HIEP had been suffering for years. Our offices have been rated, rated at least four times in the last 10 years, so it's not the first time. The former uh, Vice Minister of Foreign Affairs, Valdra Jensky, came to Washington DC to meet with every single of our donors to ask to stop financing us. And it's, it was a shock for him to know that our funding is only 12% from US funds. Most of our funding, funding comes from Denmark, from Finland, from the European Union, or from the government of Switzerland. So most of our funds, which have been frozen at this point, are actually funds from, from COSUDE, from the uh, uh, Corporation of Switzerland. So my point is that that the investment that for years have been done in building a robust civil society organization is non-ideological. So you see funding, for example, to organizations such as Popolna, 
very progressive that comes from from the European uh, progressive movements. Um, uh, the support of of, of uh, Movimiento Autónomo de Mujeres, for example, is a grassroots movement built from scratch. If you see, for example, the support of Unides comes from the Nicaraguan business sector. The support from YEP comes from the diverse source of donors. And this is not an attack only in the U.S. Ortega thinks he's doing that, but he's demolishing one of the key institutions to build civil society. And why this is so fundamental? Because Nicaragua does not have a tradition of nonviolence. If you look at our history, we have solved our conflicts through violence. And the only uh, containment through that type of resolution of conflict is civil society. Ortega needs to move the country towards his own narrative of polarization. And civil society are the organizations that are trying to keep that conflict from erupting. He's moving the country towards polarization because that how his system will work. That's my, my understanding. Uh, well, hello. Um, again, another big thank you to the dialogue for, for today. Um, my great hope for today is that this is a turning point. Uh, that we will begin to wake up English speakers around the world to what is going on in Nicaragua. Um, my name is Tanya Amador, and I've been living in Nicaragua for approximately 25 years, uh, on and off. Um, I'm the director of Corner of Love, and we're out in the Matagalpa region. And I came to Washington, D.C. in May when violence was mounting uh, all around our different facilities, and uh, things were getting very dangerous. And in fact, on, on May 15th, um, a bunch of people were killed uh, right there in Matagalpa, just feet from our front door. Um, like what Felix has explained, you know, over the years, uh, the Sandinistas really have not allowed political parties to rise up. As they gained popularity um, and were seen as leaders in the community, they, they always were very effective in just cutting the head off of that. Um, but speaking on behalf of religious leaders, um, especially out in the north of the country, um, Ortega did allow uh, Christian groups to grow and carry out um, humanitarian work. Like in, in our case, I represent Corner of Love. And prior to April, uh, we hosted more than 20 international medical, dental, um, optical brigades per year and brought in Christians that would help with um, physical needs of Nicaraguans living in, in poverty. And he, he did allow that work to go on. And so as that grew, and lots of different pastors um, were involved in this, these types of work throughout the whole country, um, that, that area of civil society, that, that group of civil society um, kept um, you know, gaining um, more, just more leadership, if you will, with, with all of the di different Nicaraguans around us. And so um, when something like this begins to happen in April, that population that's been receiving services from many different Christian Christian groups and missions like our own, uh, they look to you for leadership. They look to you for help. Um, you start receiving hundreds of texts asking people, you know, people asking you uh, for assistance. And um, it's a question of, you know, how are you going uh, to react to that? Um, in, in our case, uh, we run a school and a clinic, a hospital, have a couple of community farms and sports fields and work with a, a large um, number of people out in the Matagalpa area. We had been hearing complaints from people for many years that campesinos had been being attacked, uh, that campesinos that refused to, to fly a red and black flag would be attacked and things like that. And we had never, ever gotten involved um, in, in those types of complaints. We kind of, re, you know, thought, no, we need to remain true to, you know, our mission here. Uh, we're preaching the gospel and helping with um, medical, dental, optical needs, and that's just not a space that we're supposed to to get into. Um, but everything changed uh, in April, and, and now fast forward to today where we have over 500 dead in Nicaragua. And again, I just really hope that today is a turning point where English speakers will really wake up to what has actually happened in Nicaragua. Um, in my case, what kind of um, got me active, if you will, uh, was the, the horrific uh, event of the family being burned alive uh, in Managua, the Carlos Marx incident. Uh, where two um, two babies were burned alive. Now, 
today, fast forward to today, right, um, the leader of a human rights, of a respected human rights organization, Vilma Nunez in, in Managua, is being charged with this crime when there is video of of police at the scene and um, there's you know lots of um, lots of evidence as well as being documented in these different reports from human rights organizations as far as how that that crime played out and so um, we just see these things that are just so uh, ironic and horrific and unbelievable how can the FSLN turn turn this around and try to blame this horrific crime on the very person that has been defending people's rights there in Managua. I mean, it's just, it's absolutely ludicrous, right? And so we're at a point in time where we need English speakers to decide that they are going to become active on this issue because Ortega has shown us that um, they're just willing to kill anyone that will, will speak up, that will defend people. And with the raiding of these offices and taking of this information of files, as, as I understand, uh, you know, hundreds of files were taken from these offices that uh, are going to reveal people's names, their addresses, um, what they, uh, the statements that they made, um, that puts a whole nother population um, in jeopardy and and the police are out there and the paramilitaries are out there and you can see them um, in Nicaragua and each day uh, you know I receive pictures from people all over Nicar Nicaragua of, of paramilitaries on street corners and uh, the different things happening and so you know I really appeal um, to the the press uh, especially English speakers that can help get this message out there because one of the things that has in some ways kind of shot Nicaragua in the foot is that the population at large they 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 they're very proud of Nicaragua right I'm very proud of Nicaragua and so they they want to keep thinking it's this little country that could that we can we can do it we we had all these years we've been gaining in tourism and we're doing better and so when they bring forward information it has an inf informative tone but it it hasn't had a, a largely emotional tone but i think that that needs to change and the discourse needs to change and we need to start calling this for what it is this is a a, a murderous dictatorship that is going after peaceful people who have chosen to, you know, fill the streets and not take up arms, and that's very threatening to this regime, and that's what they don't want. Uh, you know, the, when these people use peaceful tactics to get their message to the government, that's that's very threatening to to the Ortega regime. So, um, it it really is time for the international community and and press at large around the world to to move into a role where. Uh, you just take your involvement up 10 notches, if you will, and, and start to help rescue the people of Nicaragua because uh, they've just shown us that they're, they're, they're ready to kill everyone. And now they even have the files in their hands as they uh, trump up these charges against leaders of human rights organizations. They've literally, they literally have the physical files right in front of them with the names and addresses of these people uh, that they can go after. So uh, I just second the words of Aníbal, SOS, SOS, SOS for Nicaragua. Uh, please begin using the tools that uh, you have to speak out for the Nicaraguan people because um, it, it would appear that it's only going to get worse if we don't all become much more active than we have been. Thank you. Um, we're going to open the, the floor for questions and answers. I mean, I take it that um, the major impact of this is that the, the, there are contesting narratives and practices. It's not just a discourse of violence and repression against uh, demonstration, nonviolent demonstrations for political change, but also um, in practice. Uh, you say, Aníbal says, for example, that the world must stop the dictatorship from the coercion. You also say that um, sanctions without concrete actions can um, achieves change. Um, there are international sanctions so far. Um, my question is what else can be done or is, is there is a lack of correspondence between what is happening vis-a-vis uh, -vis what is being done by the international community? Is this a problem of quantity or is really that the international community is not totally convinced that there is a real problem? Um, is the media doing enough on visibilizing the problem? Um, the major newspapers uh, internationally are publicizing what's happening, but is it that not 
that not enough, but uh, I think it seems to me that somewhat uh, you're kind of running out of ideas as to how to make people realize, but then what do you do with that awareness? Uh, is there something that um, can really effectively uh, induce the Nicaraguan government to sit down to negotiate? It seems that the strategy of the government so far is one by which you will continue to obligate, to uh, subordinate these organizations um, probably until March when then with the further deteriorated economy um, the government will basically rule by a state of emergency which is more or less the tactic that is the terrain of uh, common comfort for uh, Daniel Ortega and which is away basically from what you were talking about the civil society efforts um, so, you know, what, what can be done uh, along these lines? So let me open uh, the floor and then have this conversation with you all. Yes, we're going to take three questions, one, two, and three. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for coming. My name is Andres Jara from the Medios. Well, the thing is what I and see what happened in what is happening in Nicaragua is is kind of the same pattern that was applied in Ecuador was applied in Venezuela is that being applied in Bolivia like concentrate all the powers in one person destroy the whole institutionality and really rule the country by creating afraid to the people especially and attacking the media that is one of the the whole free press have been treated especially in the in those countries well the and the the question that is that that brings me down is the attacks that had happened last week with the CSOs and the and the and the the, the newspaper it is the how that thing is going to be addressed uh, to the OES or to UN or how they how is the going to be the strategic uh, thing? So maybe to get also the other the other people was have been affected in the region and create a big crowd out of it, so it can be uh, louder the voices. My name is Kenneth Coleman from the Association of American U Universities. It, it seems like one problem is the absence of a planilla, a, a, a group of leaders that could take over uh, after Ortega would be forced to resign or leave. Um, it's obvious why there is such an absence, because if it were identified, um, people would be killed <laughs> or targeted. But that seems like a, a considerable challenge, and I wondered if the group has thought about that issue and about how to address it. Could you provide, what, what's the way to provide the world with a vision of what would happen after Ortega? We have a special fitness program here. Hi, um, I'm Rachel Carrillo, I'm a freelance writer. Uh, my question is how your, organ your organizations are working with organizations that are specific to human rights defenders, like um, frontline defenders out of the, the UK, and how, how you work to, how you, basically how you collaborate to hopefully ensure protections for those who are stepping up for human rights and press freedoms in Nicaragua. Thank you. For these questions, um, just speaking to the, the pressure point that you mentioned from Fundamedios, yes. Um, what I neglected to mention in my um, snapshot of press freedom in Nicaragua is that there are many journalists who are now exiling themselves in neighboring countries. Some of them will even, I'm sure, try to come and seek asylum in the United States. We know that that is a very difficult time right now to be doing that, but there are journalists from Mexico, from Cuba, who are doing this all the time in the U.S., that they have a real fear of being killed for their work. And this is increasing in Nicaragua. And therefore, there's an international impact on this 
what's happening in this small country, and that is the way forward in terms of why this should be raised at the highest international levels, why uh, many different countries, not just in the region, but around the world, should care about what's going on. Um, and that's why this is something we've raised, as I mentioned, to the United Nations Secretary General. We obviously are in discussions with the OAS about this as well, but international institutions are quite important at raising this profile, whether it be behind the scenes in diplomatic negotiations or publicly by denouncing attacks in the press, which is what our organization tries to do. But also Reporters Without Borders does provide assistance. Uh, we at times uh, lend bulletproof jackets, uh, helmets to journalists going into conflict zones, provide insurance, and sometimes emergency uh, fees for legal fees or temporary stays in safe houses. But we work with a lot of different partners like Protect Defenders, um, uh, like many other organizations, to provide assistance when journalists are trying to leave a country and they may need some funding uh, or if they need a lawyer to help them in an asylum request somewhere. That is something that we're doing. But when the local infrastructure of NGOs on the ground is no longer able to operate, it really devastates what we're able to do and what, how we're able to assist. And that's why it really has to be looked at from a global uh, perspective in terms of the entire uh, network that's in the country that serves to help people like journalists um, and human rights defenders when they are in, in danger. And that's what's so concerning. Well, um, the situation in Nicaragua actually um, the fight for freedom of express um, is really hard and I think we have to keep it up, resist while the war and the international institution and like Tanya said, much more people get involved and, and help us to put more pressure on Daniel Ortega. Unfortunately, it is sad, but every time that it has been a condemnation and a sanction imposed on the government. Daniel Ortega has come back and give us uh, bullets and give us repression and destroy, taking over, um, confiscating. And it is a really difficult situation because I think the war is working on it, but I think after Ortega, we need to figure it out in our country not to build the strongest men and the caudillo again. And in some of the uh, Nicaraguan, um, we're indifferent actually on what's going on. We need to make sure the area the after Ortega we don't come back to the same situation. And it's responsible for the Nicaraguan people to make sure a caudillo, as dictatorship, as Somoza, as Arnoldo Alemán, as Ortega, don't come back. And the, it is very important. Otherwise, uh, the challenge that we're going to have after Ortega, um, I will say it, it's... Um, it's one of the biggest missions that we're going to have. It's when uh, we're going to have to rebuild our society and making sure institutions are built strongest and not believing anymore on these kind of systems and, and build um, strong men, dictatorship. And it is important to um, reinforce the idea that once Ortega is gone, it's just part of the um, challenge that we have to change Nicaragua for the future. And it is important to get involved. And then um, as a reporter without borders is doing, it is important to look into help in any way. Uh, we're just resisting. We are actually working within clandestinos because of uh, repression and persecution of the uh, regime of Daniel Ortega. 
On the first question of the international community, I think that the problem is a double moral standard and hypocrisy. Let's look at Honduras. When the coup against Celaya, and you can, how many weeks did it take for OAS and the international community to take action for the World Bank to stop loans? Months? Three weeks. So I think that the world has an issue with, uh, with ideology. I mean, the Sandinista regime in Nicaragua still takes advantage uh, of the utopia of the Sandinista revolution of 1979. So it, we need to educate the international community that number one, Daniel Ortega does not represent at all the ideals of the 1979 revolution. That is a particular problem with progressives in the U.S. and also with uh, Europe and many countries in Latin America. The second problem is I think it's uh, some sense of guilt by the United States. The United States made a, lo a lot of mistakes in Latin America over the years. So the United States is not taking leadership in a way because there's a, this, this sense of guilt. And when I, I recently spent five weeks in Europe talking to members of the European Parliament, talking to every single senior government official that gave me an appointment, and between lines, the message is that's the U.S. area of influence. They will not say it that, that way. So we are in the, in, in, the, in the middle of a mess of a world and an international community that if they cannot help us with a country like Nicaragua, we will not solve problems such as Syria or of the Middle East. I mean, Nicaragua is a, it's a country that has a firm commitment to democracy where students, women, people across every single ideology, every single ethnic group just came together and told the world, we want to get rid of this tyrant. And now going back to the question with, with human rights organizations, yes, we work with all of them and we get press releases. And local NGOs are getting together to gather condoms to give them to women prisoners. That, that's the type of actions that is happening in Nicaragua because they're saying we're gay women in prison. We are being raped every single day. Bring us condoms, bring us pills. That's the type of actions at the grassroots, which breaks my heart. So I would ask anyone who's looking at me right now, if that was your daughter or your sister in a Nicaraguan prison right now, what would you do? If there's a war in Nicaragua, I will say, and this will be on record, I am a non-violent activist. And I've been working for 11 years telling the world, please stop a war in Nicaragua. This is a message to the conservatives. This is a message to the progressives. This is a message to the Christian, to the non-Christians, to Americans, to Europeans, to every human being who cares for the life of political prisoners, who cares for the life of individuals. Just because we're a tiny country about the size of New York, in, in, in the middle of Central America, that doesn't mean that the life of a woman who's being raped right now is uh, uh, less valuable than the life of a woman in a developed country. So if you cannot help us, something really, really bad is going to happen in Nicaragua soon. Since April, 72,000 Nicaraguan has left the country. And these are Nicaraguans that, are, that left the country because they were beaten, because their brothers and sisters were killed and raped, and these are warriors. These are people that left the country not because they want to be part of a caravan that wants to come to the United States. In fact, in the US, officially about 300 people came as refugees since April. Costa Rica, 52,000 official numbers by the Costa Rican government because they're waiting to get in. There was a caravan a few hours ago from San Jose to the border, symbolic caravan, but a different type of caravan. The caravan that says we want to go back. And we want to go back with the support of the international organization. Then going back to the question of the gentleman from the Association of American Universities. You don't see names of leaders because the grassroots leaders who, who started the movement, the women that started the movement, the campesinos, the farmers who started the movement, they're completely fed up with elites. They don't want big, popular, famous names of all elites. You don't listen to their names because if I tell you the names, the names are Medardo Mairena, Irlanda Jerez, the leaders of the popular markets of Managua, Elvin Carcache, a youth leader, uh, um, Victoria Obando from the LGTV movement, Levi Rugama, Yaritza Mairena, those are the leaders. These are students, 16, 17, 18 year old in prison. These are campesinos who are just defending their lands 
Those are the leaders, and that is the new Nicaragua that emerged in April 18th. We're asking the world, we do not want any more press releases. We just want, but in Nicaragua, we're still receiving cruises from Miami that go and, and, and do tourism in, in, in Nicaragua. We're still receiving in social media pictures of the children of Daniel Ortega flying first class in Iberia in having vacations in Madrid. We just learned that their bank accounts in Mexico, bank accounts in Uruguay, bank accounts in Spain, bank accounts in the U.S. So there are tools, and these tools are nonviolent. These are institutional tools that were used in Honduras, and they're not used in Nicaragua. So I really appreciate this forum, but this will be probably my, one of my last forums in D.C. Uh, of this sort, because my work is with the grassroots, and I hope it will continue to be the nonviolent action. But I would like to conclude this part by saying that the voices of us who are preaching nonviolence in Nicaragua is starting to sound ridiculous. And there will be other people that will take my place, and those will be different type of voices. So please help us to avoid that. Thank you. <clears throat> um, we're actually pleased to, to we had this uh, pleasant surprise that our colleague Carlos Fernando Chamorro is on the line. He wants to say a few words, uh, taking advantage of the uh, of the circumstances of this event. So I'm going to put him over the phone and see if you can hear a little bit. Carlos Fernando, good morning. Good morning, Manuel. Uh, I just want to thank the Inter American Dialogue uh, and all all you guys who are present in the audience and the panelists uh, for having this uh, forum on Nicaragua. Uh, and I just want to share with you our thoughts, our feelings. We are under attack, and this is not a personal attack on myself. This is an attack of freedom, freedom, freedom of the press, freedom of expression, and we are resisting. Our offices, our newsroom is still occupied by armed police, but we are still on the air. We are still transmitting our daily TV program, our Sunday night program, until the last minute. And we are online in Confidencial. Our newsroom is working. And this is our commitment because uh, I have said that this is the least we can do to accompany the Nicaraguan people that has been the real protagonist of this civic rebellion. There are 565 political prisoners, hundreds of assassinated, dozens of thousands in exile, and we are, as journalists, are witness of this process, and we want to, we want to stay here until the last minute. I have the personal belief that we are facing a, a terminal crisis of the dictatorship of Daniel Ortega. I'm not saying it's going to leave tomorrow or in one week, but this is irreversible. It is irreversible, the resistance of the population, the empowerment of citizens with their rights, and it's also irreversible, the deepening of the economic crisis that uh, in the next weeks, in the next months, is going to have uh, deep effects in the basis of sustainment of the of the government. I'm talking about the public finance that sustain the payroll of the government, of the army, and and, so, and, and the most important subsidies uh, for 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 different services of the population. Uh, I am uh, besides the fact that we are under persecution and that we are under attack and we have fear of even worse kind of retaliation because this is a de facto state of siege. Constitutional rights have not been legally suspended, but they are suspended. And since they have committed these crimes, it is very probable that they will try to convalidate them ex post. So as as it has happened with with many other citizens in Nicaragua, it, it is very possible that they will try to criminalize us and present a, a criminal case ex post anytime. Anyways, we are 
convinced. We are optimistic of the future uh, because uh, because there is no step back on the Nicaraguan people, uh, and this is not sustainable. Uh, so so we, what 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 we are trying to do is basically to be here to be a witness of this process to tell you and to tell the world and to tell the Nicaraguan people how a criminal dictatorship is going to be replaced through civic means through a peaceful revolution. Thank you very much for all your support. We, we have felt an enormous uh, uh, energy from all of my colleagues, journalists all over the world, all many different uh, institutions, governments, in the U.S., in Latin America, in Europe, and, uh, and, and definitely we we receive this wave of solidarity as an expression of the support with the Nicaraguan journalists and the Nicaraguan people. Thank you very much. Thank you, Carlos. Great. Yeah. Um, I just today I don't want to leave without giving some practical suggestions of things that could be done. Um, yesterday I returned from Costa Rica where our organization uh, helped another organization um, organize a march that came to La Cruz in the province of Guanacaste, Costa Rica. And uh, we had almost 1,000 Nicaraguans come together for the first time. It was the first time um, that such a gathering was organized where they could um, you know, pray together, be together, march together, and show, um, you know, their continued commitment to fighting for freedom in Nicaragua. And it was very, very powerful. And um, all day as we handed out these uh, Christmas packages to uh, the Nicaraguans and shared lunch with them, it kept going through my mind that we need to have an international march. We need to do this again. We need to bring people from other countries there uh, close to the border to accompany Nicaraguans so that there's more of a world message to Daniel Ortega because he's still being able to sell this message to large uh, pockets of the country that um, there are governments that are still with him. They're, they've received funds from Taiwan and um, you know there are other governments that are still walking with them solidly. But if we could plan something together um, where we bring Nicaraguans once again to, to the Northern Territory, uh, when I saw the hope in their eyes, uh, I decided that as I come back to Washington, uh, one of my messages uh, to the people that are willing to, to get active for Nicaragua was that uh, let's do that again. Let's have another march. Uh, let's get um, pr more press there and do a better job of connecting um, articles and information to action. I know we could do it. Uh, we have a chance for a few more questions. If we let's start from here now all the way to the other side. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, my name is Jack Parker. I am an outbound uh, consular officer with the uh, U.S. Department of State going down to Managua. And I'm also one of Dr. Orozco's uh, students. Uh, just a question uh, with regards to um, reporters specifically and to Nicaraguan citizens more generally. Do any of y'all see the continued or increased amount of repression reaching a stage where the Nicaraguan government uh, seeks to impede outmigration? from Nicaragua, kind of like Castro or Chavez targeting doctors trying to leave or reporters trying to leave or anything like that. Anything that we might see uh, in a consular section that would be of significance. Buenos dias, good morning. First of all, thank you so much for all your leadership. It's really inspiring as a Nicaraguan. I can, uh, I have to appreciate and, and work together to, to, to reach the change that we need. My question is about the dialogue. Um, most of the voices from different uh, stakeholders say that the dialogue is the solution. And I was listening yesterday to an interview with uh, Azucena Ferrey, who was saying that uh, the government, Ortega, wouldn't go back to the dialogue uh, room with with the same uh, interlocutores, with the same representatives, with the Alianza Civica. 
and without and with the same mediators with the Catholic Church. Um, we know that Ortega is not so is not willing to to a dialogue, but through through pressure, we might be able to bring him back to to the dialogue. But is there a way that we we, we should offer an alternative in terms of mediators, in terms of representative in the dialogue room, the dialogue table, so that he can he can really sit. I mean, along with the pressure. I'm thinking about other other kind of uh, interlocutors, uh, interlocutors representative who can be there, who can facilitate uh, and move this forward, not being stagnant in, in this situation. That's my question. Oh, great! I get to ask a question. Uh, Don Simon or uh, Don Simone? I actually lived in Nicaragua in '73 to '74. And uh, I find it kind of appalling, maybe even more than appalling, maybe shameful, that here we are nearly 50 years later, and we're back to square one again, that another oppressive dictator in Nicaragua, things have not changed one iota. This is a commentary. My question is this. Uh, early on in the presentation, I think it might have been Mr. Shifter, mentioned that uh, testimony was provided before the uh, U.S. House of Representatives. It might have been either, actually, Manuel who provided the testimony. I believe it might have been um, before the uh, Foreign Affairs Committee, and the subject might have been the evolving human rights crisis in Nicaragua. So my question is this. What was expected to be gained by that testimony? Was anything actually gained? And does the panel have any hope or any expectations that there could be anything occurring from the new Congress that will be taking over in a couple of weeks and anything that might positively come out on that front? My name is Jesel Tobias from Voice of America. Um, you were mentioning that sanctions are not enough, and I want to know, and Oscar, uh, Manuel mentioned that, question, but I think it was an answer. I want to know what else can the U.S. specifically do, or what, what you guys would like to see from the U.S. specifically doing for the Nicaragua. And I don't know if there is any contact or any discussion with the military or anyone from the military uh, line in, in Nicaragua between the opposition and the military. Um, regarding the first question about uh, the government forces trying to impede exodus, I have not seen that. On the contrary, there have been foreign journalists who've been expelled from the country earlier, maybe in October. An Austri uh, Austrian-American journalist, Carl David Get Lusiak, was expelled from uh, Nicaragua, and others are fleeing, as I mentioned, because they are fearing for their safety. Um, and the family members of Angel uh, Ga Gaona have also fled because they've received many threats. Um, so at the at the current moment, I'm not seeing that as a trend, but perhaps the other panelists have different data involving human rights defenders and opposition leaders. In terms of pressure uh, from the U.S. government, I too am uh, quite ashamed of what has happened in the past with the U.S. policy towards Nicaragua, but if you think that we can move forward and do new things to help the people in Nicaragua, um, you know, that's really worth looking at because there is, uh, there are measures that can be taken under the Global Magnitsky Act to sanction individuals with either visa denials or freezing assets that may be in United States banks. Uh, who have committed gross human rights violations, torture, extrajudicial killing, uh, detention. And so that's something that should definitely be looked into. We've seen the United States government act on this already regarding Saudi Arabia, and that's a longtime ally of theirs. And so perhaps with Nicaragua, with some uh, collective advocacy on this, we may be able to achieve that uh, in the incoming um, Congress next year, but open to working with other organizations to do that here at RSF. Um, 
As far as uh, media independence and journalism, um, there is um, a few that is they they are on the line of uh, risking the same destination of Radio Darío that was blew it up, that I'm um, confidential, uh, Carlo Fernando, but also La Prensa, Canal 12, Café con Vos. Um, um, there is radio station from the inside of the interior of the country too, the not as much presented to the world. And I think this is just part of it, um, of a continuing attacking of the um, media and journalism in Nicaragua. And it is one of the prime's goals um, of um, Daniel Ortega to shut down media independence. But he is not taking in consideration the innovation the adjustment that we doing in order to continue fighting for the freedom of the press in Nicaragua. And it is important to the world look at to uh, give us support and then have um, a decision to be behind um, uh, behind journalism and media independent they risk in their life, actually. We just hear the message of uh, Carlos Fernandez, for Carlos Fernando Chamorro. His life is in danger. Same as Miguel Mora. Same as Luis Galeano. Same as Eduardo Enriquez. They're still fighting for it. And I'm pretty sure we're resisting and we will continue to do our mission to have um, being able to um, um, bring it up, the news, and be right next to the people. I do have the hope as a um, as, um, Nicaraguan that uh, una noche nunca ha vencido un amanecer. Y nosotros vamos a, a triunfar el régimen de Daniel Ortega está llegando a su final e, y su final es irreversible. La pregunta que nos queda acá no es que si Daniel Ortega se va o no, es que si nos va a dejar país. Y por eso es importante que el mundo reaccione, porque puede reaccionar eh, muy despacio y nos puede... Daniel Ortega le va a tomar un año para regresarnos 50 años atrás. Y por lo tanto es importante que Estados Unidos, el mundo democrático y las organizaciones internacionales vayan inclusive más allá de sanciones y condenas. Porque lamentablemente el mundo se quedó sin medidas que pudiesen intervenir en este nuevo sistema. Y por eso la tragedia de Venezuela, y por eso la tragedia de Bolivia, y por eso la tragedia de Nicaragua, porque encontraron un hueco en nuestro sistema democrático. Realmente, be honest with you, we don't have any tools actually to stop right now Daniel Ortega. It's going to take some time, and we'll do it. But as the right now, what is urgent to stop Daniel Ortega, we don't have any tools. OEA, UN, the United States, and so many organiz organismos y países democráticos no tienen la medida coercitiva para parar a Daniel Ortega. Por eso, ustedes ven que por sanciones, condenas, y que se le imponen a Daniel Ortega, y seguro, eh, espérenlo, después que firme el presidente Donald Trump, la ley, podemos estar a espera de la próxima ronda de destrucción de medios de comunicación y ataque a los, a la, a los ciudadanos nicaragüenses. Y es importante que el mundo lo sepa. Y debe Daniel Ortega parar el crimen de lesa humanidad que nos está cometiendo. Y no vamos a echar un pie atrás, vamos a resistir. Y las palabras de Carlos Fernando y de todos mis colegas 
es que van a resistir en la línea de fuego, en la línea de ataque de Daniel Ortega. Pero es importante, como decía Tania, ayúdennos. Involúcrense, súmense a este esfuerzo de detener una tragedia inmensa en Nicaragua, que se puede en este momento, y debemos de hacerlo, con todos los recursos que sean necesarios. Ya decía Félix, un hombre que ha creído en la paz y ha sido un defensor de paz. Las opciones se están terminando. Y se están terminando porque Daniel Ortega regresa una y otra vez con golpearnos a matar, a meternos a la cárcel cada vez que el mundo toma una acción para tratar de pararlo. question of, of, of uh, forced exile is, is actually a deep one. I, I think that that has turned into a sort of a, a valve for, for the system where the pressure is released. And, uh, and we see the other pattern, not, not of the regime trying to stop people, but the complete opposite. In fact, if, if, if you allow me, I'll give you my personal example. The first arrest warrant was issued when I was here in Washington, D.C. in June. And uh, um, it was the first arrest warrant that was issued in Nicaragua. And I made a tough decision of going back to Nicaragua even after that. And they made it very publicly. It was a, pre a national press conference. Um, And I made the decision of going back because I knew that if I stayed here, it would be easier for the next uh, um, attacks. To do. So I, I tried to elevate as much as I could the political cause. I went back, and as some of you know, I had to survive a second assassination attempt. Then I was beaten, was sent to the hospital, and I had to leave the country eventually because I was putting a lot of people in danger. I was living at some houses, and the people that were hosting me Uh, were threatened. So at, at some point you have to leave or, or something really, really bad is it, it, happening. But people in Nicaragua do not want to leave. That's a characteristic of, of the resistance movement in Nicaragua that is very different from, from other parts of the world. The people really want to stay and they want to stay in a, in a non-violent resistance, which is really impressive after a, everything we've seen. You know, at some point the regime, if you do the math, was killing one people on average every five hours. That's, that's impressive for a tiny country like, like, like Nicaragua. On the question of dialogue, um, we recently had a meeting with the National Unity, the Unidad Nacional Azul y Blanco, so I can speak on behalf of the Unidad Nacional. And uh, whether we like it or not, and, and uh, despite the different you know, voices, there is an official position of both the National Unity and the Civic Alliance, and it's the dialogue. You know, I know that it's a controversial matter, but it's a, it's a comprehensive uh, a movement. As a comprehensive coalition, we still believe in nonviolence, and we believe that nonviolence requires dialogue. We are open-minded in terms of the, of the mechanisms. Uh, we recently spoke with uh, the, the European Parliament, and we were asked that question, and we are not... Um, Uh, close-minded in the sense that who uh, are the mediators, so we are open to suggestions. So the, the Nicaraguan people at this point is, is firmly committed. Civil society organizations are committed. The business sector, we're all committed, despite our different points of views on some secondary matters. On the issue of the of, uh, transition towards democracy, we want to give peace a chance. But I'm not trying to be dramatic here. I just came back from Costa Rica I visited a, a, a lot of refugee centers, and Tania was, helped us uh, doing that on the, on, the, on the border of Costa Rica, different municipalities in San Jose as well. And you know that what I'm saying is absolutely true. I mean, we go back, I've been, this is my fifth trip since April to Costa Rica, and this time was really rough. I mean, the, 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 the people are really organized, and they're telling you, if you're going to come once more to, t to tell us about dialogue, if you're coming once again to tell us to wait, Please do not come back again. And my point is that uh, as much as we dislike it, uh, we are, and when I say we know, the, the, the set of civil society leaders that, w that were surprised by history with the position of some type of leadership, we're losing our voices. We're losing our influence. We're losing the capacity to hold thousands of students, thousands of campesinos. We're losing our capacity to hold them and to ask them to be patient. 
And I will say something in camera that is really uh, controversial, but it's my moral and ethical responsibility. There are plenty of weapons in Central America. Starting a war in Central America is not that hard. It just takes someone from the organized crime that wants a private army, land in every uh, 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 tiny town of Honduras in Costa Rica, drop some thousands of dollars and just start a mess there, you know? And it's going to be really hard. As someone who has devoted his entire life in post-conflict reconstruction and disarmament, it pains my heart to see, as the gentleman said again, you know, 50 years again, another civil conflict. So the, the possibility of violent conflict of certain scale, it's real, and we need to stop it. This is not something against Mr. Ortega. It's not something against uh, the, 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 the political part, uh, Sandinista party in Nicaragua. It goes beyond my personal dislike of Ortega. It's something about the future of Nicaragua because both Sandinistas, non-Sandinistas, opposition, everyone will lose if we, if we, if we are, are, are um, uh, violent. So we need to give peace a chance. With the question of sanctions, my, my, my particular concern is that sanctions cannot be only from the U.S. because that fits into the narrative of Ortega. So what would I like to, to see from the U.S.? More global leadership. You cannot, with all due respect as a, uh, uh, to, 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 the, to the American people and to uh, uh, their government, you cannot try to play both sides, so try to be a global leader and do not take action. You know, so it, it, it's 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 an, it's a um, a difficult role to play. So I would like to see more joint cooperation with the European Union, working together with the UN. So I think that multilateral action is very important. Uh, I I think that by the US not really working closely with the UN is a problem, and also with the business sector. I think it's in mo it's uh it's unethical that there are plenty of American companies that continue to do business with the Ortega regime. And I will end it up there. To respond to the question about the congressional hearings um, and what was the goal from that, um, I, I was present at a, a few different things there on the Hill, and I think that the goal was um, to make sure that the NECA Act passed. You know, it, it really wasn't a done deal. I mean, it took a long time to get it to go through and everything, and I think that that, that worked, and that additional information uh, was very helpful. Um, to all of the different government leaders there, so we're happy about that. Um, this is a political pol problem that needs a political solution, and so it's nat natural that um, international, you know, media are, are leery to kind of get involved. And and I would really like to point everybody back to the violations of human rights and have that be your 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 inserting point, um, because. It, so many people have died, and like what Felix is sharing about, you know, the women needing condoms in jail, we have to ratchet it up so much, so much more. Everybody has to, un you know, look at what's in front of you, what are the tools available to you, and where do you insert into this problem? And even though it's a political problem that needs a political solution, where's your voice? Is it to uh, help your articles connect to actions on the behalf of business leaders? Is it um, to, you know, tweeting at your government? Um, I know that the media is really good at, at stirring up reactions, you know, from, from your own governments. Um, but it still isn't happening. And um, especially in the case of Canada, there's a large expat community in Nicaragua of Canadians. And, uh, and I still see them, you know, uh, reacting very lukewarm in general, speaking speaking generally to what's going on in Nicaragua, and so um, part of the reason for that is because the articles being uh, being produced in their own countries are, you know, the temperature is not right. The temperature should be very hot, but it's it's just too lukewarm, and so. Um, we just need more forums, more places to come together, um, more ways to connect international voices. And this community of citizens that are all linked to this common goal of freedom uh, needs support. And so, um, you know, I just urge people to uh, find a nonprofit or an individual that's working on keeping these people together because like Felix is talking about, you know, they're the, the huge majority of them are in are in Costa Rica and and they need support and it is getting harder and harder to to keep responding to their to their pleas with wait please be patient you know things are happening they aren't happening fast enough for people who don't have food and a place to stay um, and just really quickly I, I I'd like to end with um, 
something that I saw o over last weekend um, at our Relief Center for Refugees uh, there in La Cruz. An elderly gentleman came in. He was the first one through our doors and went right to a chair and sat down and began weeping. And the tears were just completely flowing down his face and he asked for prayer. And we went over to pray with him and he said, I'm from Sebaco. People were killed in Sebaco. There was killing all around me. I left my wife. I've left my family. I'm away from my grandchildren at Christmas. I'm sleeping on the streets of San Jose. Will you please pray for me? And that was so difficult to sit with this mature man who wept to the point that his hands and his, his clothing was wet right there with me. And it's just absolutely heartbreaking. We need to do a better job of connecting the dots of articles with action and get more people in the in the media involved. And, and it's a political problem that needs a political solution, but look at it from a human rights uh, angle and insert yourself wherever you can. Thank you very much. We have uh, run out of time. Um, I, I want to thank you. The all of the panelists that spoke. I, I want to raise uh, just comment close with three points. One is the, the significance of the Nicaraguan government response. Um, two is this idea of the new interlocutors and three, the role of international pressure. Um, I think the, the government response, it's, it, it seems at first somewhat irrational, but uh, there is a to coin the phrase that is being thrown around, we, we're plagued in Washington with a lot of cold wars and euphemisms, but non-legitimate rule in Latin America and the Caribbean in particular is the new normal. And it's not, uh, Nicaragua is not the only place, Venezuela, Cuba, Haiti, Bolivia, Guatemala are not the exceptions. And this poses a major problem as to how to come up with different strategies to cope with this reality that was something that we thought it was left in the 1980s. Yet non-democratic rule, it's a pattern in the Americas in, in the, at this stage of the 21st century. And the, what is happening is that there is basically somewhat of a, a policy of survival. Um, while civil society and citizenship in general is more conducive, more interested in democratic uh, cultures, there is still the old guard, the, the old leadership that seeks to retain political authority through the old-fashioned coercive mechanisms. And if you, when you look at the different leaders in all of these countries, you will see the same pattern happening uh, from coming from all these activists from uh, the period of of human rights uh, violations. Um, I do agree with, uh, or with Carlos Fernando Chamorro that, you know, there is a, th these are the terminal moments. However, uh, this terminal period can take 18 months. And this is where the international community does play an important role. Um, the, the role I think is, is, is one, one fundamental issue is within this context of this new normal is to really make more visible the legitimate reasons of why these demonstrations are, um, happening. It's not simply because the government killed people. It's not to minimize the fact that there are human rights violations, but it's the fact that there is actually a non-legitimate government that has been, uh, committing these atrocities. And the non-democratic practice of the government is really something that goes back for at least 10 years since he was elected the first time in 2007. So this is a really important issue. Make visible the, the fact of that. And the second aspect of, I, I do think that the international community has moved forward and it's not just the, the US sanctions. The response of Ortega, Ortega was waiting for the sanctions to do what he had in, la in mind to do. This is, we knew, um, we had a conversation in September with Carlos Fernando Chamorro when the, the NICA Act submitted by Menendez, uh, had been put into the Senate, uh, was about to be voted that Ortega had a list of institutions of civil society organizations that were going to be punished for that, but that was the excuse, not the real uh, causal element. Um, so the, this, the whole strategy is to basically uh, 
had a foot on top of all of these uh, civil society organizations because they do represent a legitimate claim to political change. Um, so the sanctions do have a significant impact, particularly the role of OFAC, uh, because it neutralizes the capacity of continued uh, survival of these type of entities that are non-democratic and corrupt. The multilateral di diplomacy works, but it takes a longer period of time. It takes longer period of time because it takes a lot of effort to put together all these groups to have a consensus. And yes, the working group should be more proactive at doing something else other than having meetings and saying, you know, things continue to deteriorate. Um, and finally, I think it, you're probably right. It, the need of a new interlocutor is is a is an important issue. Uh, but as long as it's within the context of the this alliance of the UNAV, this national alliance, the new interlocutors, um, you know, El Salvador, for example, didn't really reach a successful peace agreement until the the more uh, important stakeholders decided to negotiate with the guerrillas the people in the private sector. The economic elite of El Salvador was the one who really put their hands together to go and negotiate the peace, not the, the government itself. And in Nicaragua, the role of the private sector is still uh, very important. Um, the economic elite is scared right now that um, Ortega is going to go after them. It's likely that he will go. We don't know who is he going to pick. And that's every, that's why everybody's kind of freaked out. It's also scared that, um, there was a lobbying in the United States to stop the NICA Act from happening paid by the private sector. So now they feel alone. They, they, they feel that the U.S. who could have supported them feel alone. So from the, the U.S. foreign policy perspective, the United States should reach out, uh, with the private sector to figure out a way to understand that there is a common interest on, uh, the need for political reforms in Nicaragua. But um, the new interlocutor should be people from the private sector who actually have a true uh, role uh, at stake in political change in Nicaragua, particularly on the economic issues. And that uh, is something that will really show their moral uh, fiber uh, in play. Uh, with that, thank you very much for coming. and. Let's try to look forward for a better year in the 2019. Thank you very much.